Yeah, we start this uh, endovascular after session one at the uh, uh, TCAP 2021. My name is Taewon An from Korea University. Our co chair, co moderator is uh, Brian and Yan from Hong Kong. We have uh, five presentations here. I, and we have also excellent uh, panelists uh, Mohamed uh, Pashori, uh, Jen Kuang Lee. Hiroishi, okay. I started, uh, I need to do the first speaker, Dr. Donna Xuan Lin from National Taiwan University Hospital, Taiwan. Is, uh, the topic is uh, into urban self expanding nitrogen stent with a drug coated balloon angioplasty for the treatment of severely calcified superficial femoral regions to your outcomes. Dr. Lin, please. Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Donna Lin from National Taiwan University Hospital in Taiwan. And it is my pleasure today to share with you um, a study that we did entitled Interwoven Self-Expanding Nitrile Stent with Drug-Coated Balloon Angioplasty for the Treatment of Severely Calcified SFA Lesions. And we are reporting two-year outcomes of these patients. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, to start with, I would like to bring your attention to the role of DCBs in the treatment of VEMPOP lesions. We know that DCBs um, deliver antiproliferative drugs to these lesions and improve the primary patency rates of PTA. But we also know that these patients also often have severely calcified lesions in their um, vessels. And the fact that the calcium limits the DCB efficacy is a problem that we face every day. We know that calcium distribution and severity affects late lumen loss and primary patency rates of PTA, and also that the calcium is a barrier to optimal drug absorption. In addition, as you can see from the diagram at the uh, left lower corner, the fact that the patient has calcium in their vessels also leads to severe recoil after balloon angioplasty. So what we are facing each day in these patients is restenosis. And restenosis can be caused by two mechanisms primarily. So the first being recoil and negative remodeling and the second being neointimal hyperplasia. And to combat neointimal hyperplasia, basically we use DCBs, like we mentioned before, the anti-proliferative drugs in these balloons. Whereas for recoil and negative remodeling, this is where the stenting comes in. But we know that calcium and atheromas um, lead to severe recoil and negative remodeling. And so in these patients, we often are forced to perform bailed out stent stenting to combat this problem. Um, this is an example of a patient that we treated a couple of months ago. And you can see that he has very severe calcification in his SFA with very, uh, so it's basically very hard to perform balloon angioplasty. This is the CTA of this patient. You could see that even on the non-contrast CT, you could also, you could almost completely visualize his vessel. So he has a very severe uh, calcification. So uh, it would be favorable to remove the calcium from the arteries prior to balloon angioplasty to improve drug delivery and um, primary patency rates. Basically, this is what we do with atherectomy, and we know that there are multiple ways we can perform atherectomy, as shown on this middle um, diagram here. And in Taiwan, we have multiple atherectomy devices, as shown here, but sadly, none of them are reimbursed by our national health insurance. So the ideal goal of DCB angioplasty is, of course, to leave nothing behind. But in reality, when we face severe calcifications, long lesions, or chronic total occlusions, we are often forced to perform stenting because basically you can't um, deal with these problems without some other ways with stronger radial force, etc. So um, this patient that we saw his um, angiography just before, you could see that he had a very long calcified SFA uh, chronic total occlusion. So in this patient, we were forced to perform stenting and spotted lesions that were necessary. 
So in our study, basically what we would like to evaluate was whether the combination of a stenting system such as Supera in combination with DCBs would perform better than DCB alone. So we enrolled 387 patients who underwent PTA for FEMPOP lesions in our institution and we followed them for up to two years. And the primary outcome that we were interested in was clinically driven um, target, lesion, target lesion revascularization at one year. And prior to PTA, all of these patients underwent a CTA. And what we did was we evaluated the calcification in these vessels via a plaque analysis module in the computer. And what we did was looking at specific Hounsfield units, we identified the calcium in their lesions and cal uh, calculated the volume of calcium in these lesions and subsequently gave it a grading. And without further ado, let's look at our results. So basically, um, these patients were enrolled in a retrospective observational study, and we could see that the combination of Supera with the DCB performed better than DCB alone at two years in terms of freedom from revascularization. And if we looked at the patients in two groups divided by their calcium volume, so the half of patients with less calcium performed better than the other half with the more calcium, which was very easy to imagine. Now, if we combine these two factors, we could see that the combination of Supera and DCB was not affected that much by the amount of calcium there was in these lesions. But when we performed DCB alone, the amount of calcium would influence the freedom from revascularization um, of these patients, as you could see from the difference between the dotted blue line and the blue line. So in conclusion, we feel that Supera with the DCB is more effective than DCB alone, and also that the efficacy of DCB decay, as we all know, and the rate of decay would be faster and more severe as the severity of calcification increases. But on the other hand, the efficacy of Supera with the DCB was consistent, irrespective of the severity of calcification. So two points I would like to um, bring up for discussion. One was the method of quantification of calcium. So in our study, we looked at the patient's CTA and calculate the calcium volume from there. But we know that there are other modalities such as peripheral um, arterial calcium scoring system and also intravascular um, ultrasound or OCTs. And I was wondering um, if th there is any experience from other institutions regarding this aspect. And also we would like to Primarily because, in essence, a supera with a DCB is ADS, if you could think of it that way. So what is the role of DS in the treatment of FEMPOP lesions? And this would be my presentation. I pass the time back to our moderators. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dean, for the nice presentation. Uh, we have an uh, open discussion for the, this case. Any questions and comments from the... Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've got a question. Okay. Do you have a slide or some information about the, the type of lesion in each group? Are they comparable? And are they, I mean, if you talk about more calcium, less calcium, but, uh, you know, by comparing two groups, do we know in terms of lesion length, you know, are they, are they sort of comparable between the two groups? What type of lesion we're dealing with? Okay. Of course, it's certainly Hang possible on, to show this second. better outcome, but uh, I think it's... Uh, Maybe uh, uh, maybe difficult to make sense yes, of uh, unless we know what type of lesion in each group are they comparable. Okay. All right. So hang on a second. Let me open these this document. So basically, um, because of the time limit, I failed to um, mention before, the underlying demographics were similar between the um, two groups, whereas the type of lesion, because this was a retrospective observational study, basically the patients underwent stenting once it was deemed necessary after um, pre-dilatation. And so in our study, um, the extent of calcification was, of course, assessed prior to PTA, prior to PTA with the CTA. And the differences between the 
mean calcium volume between the two groups was so for the group who underwent superior with the DCB, the mean calcium volume was 1,421 um, millimeters cubed, whereas those that underwent DCB alone was 1,381 millimeters cubed. So there was a difference of maybe 100 millimeters cubed of calcium between these two groups, but this was a very small difference. Um, basically, the lesion length and the um, amount of and the underlying demographics, including patients with ESRD, was similar between the two groups. So primarily, um, the underlying conditions of these two groups was basically similar. Um, sadly, I do not have a PowerPoint slide. I could just read off the um, no tables that we had. But they were around about 100, 1,400 millimeters cubed of calcium in these lesions, which were not significantly different between the two groups. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have DES in Taiwan, right? You have uh, the silver PDX or the Eluvia. And how, you know, how would that compare with, you know, your makeshift Supera plus DCB, you know, even though it's not obviously head to head, but you know, from your retrospective, do you have any data? Right. So um, at this moment, we have not had any data that directly compared, like you said, head to head between Supera and DCB and a DES. Um, we started this um, study because of the prior rapid that compared the DCB uh, the DCB with the, oh, sorry, Supera with DCB to Supera alone. And so we were thinking of, what we were thinking of was, for one thing, the atherectomy devices were not all reimbursed in Taiwan, and it would be preferable if there was another way to deal with calcification in our patients. So at this time, uh, what we were thinking of was how to deal with the um, the recoil and the dissections after balloon angioplasty. So we compared the balloon angioplasty with balloon plus a stent. And I think, of course, it would be very helpful if we had more data on Supera with DCB and DS as a head-to-head -head comparison. But sadly, at this point, we do not have any data on this. I think it would be a very interesting field and it really would be a um, something that we could look forward to in the future, yes. Well, you're, quite, uh, you're an expert in uh, DS. Yes. Uh, so what do you think of this approach? Because you're quite... Yeah. What do you think of this approach? Uh, I think the this approach... Uh, mm, I asked to, to Dr. Lim that the mm, timing of the usage of the DCB is the prior stenting or after stenting. This study is all of the after stenting uh, after stenting DCB, prior stenting DCB, which is it? Okay, so um, in our institution, most of these patients, we, so basically stenting was a bailed out procedure, if, yeah. if you know what I mean. So basically we, uh, our goal was to leave nothing behind, like I said before, the ideal goal was to leave nothing behind. So these patients underwent stenting if after DCB angioplasty, we found that there was a, a long dissection or severe recoil that required stenting. So basically all of our patients who underwent Supera with the DCB, did we got DCB first and then the stenting was done if it was deemed necessary um, after the balloon angioplasty. Uh, thank so you, thank you, Dr. Dean. Okay, we, we have a, uh... It's time limitation, so you move to the uh, next uh, topics. Next present is uh, Dr. Prijemak uh, Dorkowski from University of Technology, uh, Katowice, uh, Poland. Your talk is uh, microcrystalline pectitaxel coated balloon for the reverse crystallization of the pump-up artery disease. Uh, three outcomes of the randomized BIPEC trial. Dr. Nowakowski, please. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I would like to present uh, um, my uh, work from Biopark trial. And my topic is connected to very hot discussion in peripheral intervention with paclitaxel coated balloon and potential higher mortality in long-term observation. 
uh, maybe outcomes our biopack trial can be one of the answer. Uh, outcomes uh, our study was present on uh, last year on TCT and Vite Symposium. My disclosure. Uh, Early studies show that uh, paclitaxel carted balloons significantly improves late outcomes of treatment the lesion in SFA and popliteral artery. We have still better and better devices, uh, but last year was uh, very hard for drug technology in peripheral vessels. And uh, we have current very hot topic in long-term mortality in group patients after paclitaxel carted balloon treatment. Uh, Polish company Barton produced new second generation uh, dragonotic balloon with mycocrystalline paclitaxel and uh, biodegradable polymer as an um, excipient. Drug concentration uh, is uh, 3 micrograms on square millimeter. We performed a clinical study and uh, analysis of animal model. This was pig model. Uh, as for treatment efficiency and lumen stenosis, uh, shows the advantage of uh, pack balloon group. What about study? This was first in men study. Main goal was to evaluate safe and efficiency our balloon. Study was uh, prospective control randomized. We have five stat sites uh, in the study, and uh, I was one from two principal investigators. Study was registered in clinical trials, uh, and first patient was enrolled in June 2014, and last control angiography was performed on, in January 2017. Inclusion criteria Rutherford class 1 to 4, femoral popliteral lesions up to 15 centimeters stenosis or occlusion and protocol allowed relations de novo or patient with significant restenosis after early POBA. Generally, we have five patients with restenosis. Randomization after crossing lesion with the guide wire. Uh, study endpoints, primary and primary endpoint late lumen loss and secondary endpoints, serious adverse events like death, amputation, myocardial infection, thrombosis, target vessel and target lesion revascularization. And let me show a study flowchart. Uh, we have 66 patients with symptomatic lesions in femoral popliteal segment. Randomization one to one group after crossing guide wire and plain balloon angioplasty. After randomization, we have two groups with 33 patients. In control group, after plain balloon angioplasty, we finished procedure. In examinated group, we used pack balloon group, pack balloon, and a little bit longer as plain balloon from a standard angioplasty. Uh, after three months, we perform control examination, duplex and ABA, and uh, after six months, uh, we perform control angiography. After one year and three years after procedure, we perform follow-up and clinical examination and uh, duplex uh, examination. Uh, this, this slide shows uh, clinical characteristics both group. And generally, both groups are very similar. Statistically significant was only a bigger number of uh, male in pack balloon group. Uh, in procedural data, we don't observe statistically significant differences. Uh, then again, bigger diameter shade in pack balloon, but this is uh, nothing strange. By law, stenting in both groups was 37-38%. Uh, and this picture illustrated a main goal after six months follow-up and significant differences in late lumen loss in favor of the pack balloon group 0 0.52 to 1.39. And follow-up after one year, now we see outcomes after one year follow-up and significant reduction and better outcomes in uh, pack balloon group reduction, serious adverse event, target lesion, and target vessel revascularization. And outcomes after mm, three years, we have still better significant reduction of serious adverse events uh, in pack balloon group. And uh, what about uh, topic about mortality in group patients after uh, treatment uh, with uh, paclitaxel carted devices? 
uh, in our study, we don't confirm higher mortality aflitaxel after paclitaxel coated balloon angioplasty versus plain balloon angioplasty. Uh, after a few years, we perform analysis of uh, uh, death during study and we don't confirm a uh, death uh, device and procedure uh, related. Uh, big point from a big point from serious adverse events in favor of pack balloon uh, target vessel vascularization significant reduction of repeated revascularization in uh, paclitaxel microcrystalline paclitaxel uh, cutted balloon group after a few years we perform uh, two uh, analysis and found significantly lower uh, Rutherford class in the pack balloon group but this uh, shows no differences in uh, ABI. Our analysis ambulatory uh, car in both group doesn't show statistical significant differences, but more patients from pack balloon group are current smokers. I don't know why. Uh, and we see trend to be lower level ambulatory care in pack balloon group, but this is not statistically significant. Pharmacological treatment uh, in PAC balloon and POBA group are very similar and we have differences in, uh, and the laboratory uh, checks after three years uh, shows only one finding uh, higher creatine level in PAC balloon group but no patients have renal insufficiency diagnosis during follow-up. And so let me show short conclusions. Our results of our trial show safety and efficiency of local paclitaxel utilizing biodegradable polymer in the SFA and um, when compared to POBA up to three years. In this trial, were no increase uh, in mortality in PAC balloon group in the case of serious adverse events and target vessel vascularization significant reduction in favor of pack balloon group. Interesting the adherence to ambulatory care regimen after PCB treatment tended to be lower when compared to POBA, but not statistically significant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nowakowski, uh, for the uh, interesting and nice presentation. Any questions and comments for this? This presentation. Anyone? Okay, Dr. Yukui. Very nice presentation and then the very interesting data. I asked to you this new types of DCB compared with the old one DCB at the slow flow, no flow, uh, after dilated the DCB, such kind of the phenomenon, um, how much occurred? Uh, I think that uh, the new technology. Uh, from this uh, type of double balloon is um, excipient. Uh, this is a biodegradable polymer and maybe this is a K for, for good uh, results. We don't use the, uh, this is a, 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 a comment for previously presentation, eligible comments. Uh, we don't use uh, vessel preparation. We, we know uh, a topic about vessel preparation before using the CB, uh, but on this, uh, on this, on this, um, on my, on my uh, biopack trial, we don't use vessel preparation with special devices. We use only uh, plain balloon angioplasty before before the CB. Thank you, Dr. Dovakowski. So uh, next we have uh, Dr. K uh, Khalil from uh, Tantra University from Egypt and his uh, topics on common femoral artery anatomy in relations to bony landmarks, a CT angiogram study from the Egyptian population. So Dr. Khalil. Common femoral artery anatomy and relations to the bony landmark from CT tomography uh, angiogram among the Egyptian population at our university hospital. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, actually. So introduction, despite the advantage of the radial artery axis over the femoral artery in most of the coronary uh, angiogra angiography and coronary intervention, the femoral axis remains the main axis in some intervention as preferred interventions or 
where we require like large sheaths as uh, taver or carotid interventions. And with the wide uh, adoption of the radial axis, femoral axis complication may increase due to the lack of experts and lack of daily practice. The aim of our work is to pro provide descriptive, uh, descriptive, descriptive anatomy of the common femoral artery among the Egyptian population through CT angio of the lower limb and trying to find a fixed landmark visible by fluoroscopy that can help perfect femoral artery function during different intervention procedures. We retrospectively collect CT of peripheral angiograms in our department. In our, uh, department dimensions and lens on the common femoral artery will measure the origin and bifurcation site of the common femoral artery was described and recorded according to five imaginary zones in relation to the femoral head zone one zone one is above the femoral head zone two is the upper third of the femoral head zone three is the middle third of the femoral head and zone four is the lower third of the femoral head and zone five is uh, below the femoral head. Also, bifurcation site of the common femoral artery was described and recorded according to the three imaginary zones in relation to the pubic tubercle. Zone, zone one is above the pubic tubercle, zone two is at the level of the pubic tubercle, and zone three is below the pubic tubercle. We had like 414 femoral arteries were in, uh, reviewed in CT scan. 34 were excluded, either due to occluded or incomplete opacification, and 380 were included in our study. These are the common femoral dimensions, the length and diameter, minimum and maximum diameters in the Egyptian population. And as regarding the origin of the common femoral artery, the origin, uh, the nadir point of the inferior artery was noted to be almost always above zoom four. Uh, zoom four, like almost like 100% is above zoom four. So we, and uh, as regard the bifurcation, uh, it shows that zoom three is the safest site to do, uh, avoid the lower lower puncture or avoid the bifurcation puncture. These are the data regarding zone two, three, four, and five. The five, zone five has the most site of the bifurcation, but zone four also had a lot of bifurcations. So from this, we conclude that Combining two landmarks increase the accuracy of our safe puncture. Zone four is the safest site for to avoid higher puncture, and zone three is the safest site, site to avoid low puncture but has high risk of higher puncture. So while zone three seems to be safer option than zone four in terms of avoiding low puncture, adding the pubic tubercle in consideration with the puncture in zone four above or at the level of the pubic tubercle can increase the probability of avoiding lower puncture from 66% to 84% with significant p value. So I think the discussion is the difference between other techniques in proper uh, common femoral artery puncture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tao, for your presentation. Is there any comments from the panel? Uh, I will uh, thank you, Dr. Bryant. Uh, uh, I will uh, the comment. The... Yes, Dr. Uh, the comment was whether any 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 uh, data on complications. Yeah, uh, from your your from different zones. Okay, so the thing is, it was just a descriptive study. We uh, we didn't. Uh, intervene on this patient in this in this patient we just analyzed the anatomy of their femoral artery regarding to this uh, procedure like we we didn't and we didn't puncture these femoral arteries we just uh, record the, like describe their relations uh, to to this we, we we're trying to find study. we're trying to find the best site for common femoral artery in relation to the bony landmarks I think um, I think we I think bony landmarks probably one of the uh, in the easiest way of you know, like that the former head 
as a side of puncture. I think most of us will aim for that, but I think but we always get caught out by you know obviously the high high publication that which we want to avoid. But how many any comments of actually now instead of using uh, landmark, we're actually using ultrasound. Now we've got like as, as a guy. So yeah, that the thing is uh, in my country, like ultrasound is not uh, available in all the cath labs. Hmm. And uh, still, like it's, uh, the timing, like it's, it's it's easy, but it's not available in all the cath lab in Egypt. Right. Any comments from other panel members? Okay. If no, um, thank you, Rakel. We'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is, is uh, Dr. Liu from uh, the Tri Service General Hospital from Taiwan and his topics on uh, neutral field to lymphocyte ratio associated with uh, risk of mortality in patients with critical ischemia. So, Dr. Liu. Chair, moderators, and physicians, I'm Dr. Liu Zhengwei, and it's our honor to present this study at TCPAP. We declare no competing interests. Neutral field to lymphocyte ratio represents inflammation and immunity, an elevated NLR has been associated with proper prognosis in patients with ischemic stroke or in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Although some studies report the association between NLR and prognosis, but they, re they did not report it then comprehensively. Therefore, our study aimed to investigate the association between NLR and comprehensive cardiovascular outcomes. Let's go to our study material and methods. We included CLI patients under one percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. Our study number uh, was 159. After we excluded three patients with a non salvageable limb who refused amputation surgery, and we excluded two patients with missing data for NLR. Our study design is a retrospective cohort study and the study period is during 2013 and 2018. Our follow-up period was cross-sectional follow-up until the end of 2019. And the study outcomes includes all-cause mortality, cardiac-related mortality, mass and male. Firstly, we use LC curve to determine the best threshold to predict uh, each study outcome. Uh, NLR of eight, was the best cutoff to determine the outcome regarding occult mortality, cardiac related mortality, and mass. In, in major adverse limb events, uh, NLR of six may be also used regard, based on the RC curve. Then we divide the CRI patients into NLR less than A versus more than A. Table, table one shows specialized characteristics. In the CRI patients, we can find the higher NLR group had, uh, had a greater value of heart rate at baseline, uh, 93 versus 86, and the p-value is significant. Regarding the presence of acute limb ischemia, we can find that the higher NLR group had uh, around 30% versus 8% uh, presence of acute ischemic, acute ischemic limb and the p-value is significant. The patient with NLR more than 8 also had a greater case of Russell classification, 14 percentage versus 3.6%. Regarding, regarding lab data, the patient with NLR more, more than 8 had great values of alanine transaminase white blood cell count, neutral field ratio, and the NLR. But the lymphocyte ratio was lower in the NLR more than eight group. We can find the NLR was uh, around, around 19 versus around four in the two groups. No significant difference were, were found in the two groups. Let's go to the study outcome. The green light denotes NLR more than eight, and the blue light denotes NLR less than eight. We can find the NLR more than eight was also had greater instance of occult mortality. Green light denotes NLR more than eight. The, the significant uh, incidence can be also found in cardiac 
relative mortality, measure adverse cardiac events, and measure adverse limb events. In logistic regression analysis, we can find light occur. We can find light uh, NLR as a continuous variable, or NLR more than eight versus less than eight, will significantly associate with all cause mortality. If we use NLR more than eight, the adjusted hazard ratio was more than three fold. Regarding the association between NLR and cardiac related mortality, we can find the similar association. NLR more than eight versus NLR less than eight was significantly associated with increased cardiac related mortality. The adjust hazard ratio was more than five four. But the significant association cannot be found regarding major adverse cardiac events and major adverse limb events. But if we use the threshold of NLR of six, we can find that NLR, NLR more than six is associated with uh, increased major adverse limb events. The adjust hazard ratio was almost, almost threefold. Now let's go to the discussion. Uh, a higher neutral field ratio indicates a stronger information in patients with low extremity arterial disease. In our cohort, patients with a low lymphocyte ratio were relatively immunocompromised and predisposed to occult mortality, resulting from CRI induced sepsis. Now, in conclusion, our study showed that an elevated NLR was associated with prognosis in the CRI patients, including occult and cardiac related mortality and major adverse limb events. The cutoff value of NLR vary widely regarding study population and outcomes. In our cohort study, NLR more than A can be used to predict occult and cardiac related mortality, and NLR more than C can be used to predict major adverse limb events. And it's the end of my lecture. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your excellent presentation. Is there any comment from our esteemed panel? If not, I've got a question, Dr. Liu. Um, it looks like um, in one of the last slides um, that I think Rosa class was also a very strong predictor. So how is there any additional pronostic uh, like uh, uh, prediction for using your factor on, on top of the others uh, because the uh, because the most significant confounders was the presence of acculean ischemia and uh, baseline loss of stage so we adjust for it but nr still significantly associated with the study outcome so uh, the other confounders include baseline heart rate. If the patient had uh, the greater values of heart rate, the patient had a worse outcome. But after adjustment for these confounders, NLR still was still associated with the prognosis. So your population includes patients with acute limb ischemia and so chronic critical limb ischemia, is it correct? Yes. Do you have you try to separate the two because it's, they seem to be just two slightly different population. People present with acute limb ischemia and sort of a, sort of more chronic, you know, critical ischemia. Do you think there will be any difference? Uh, okay, because uh, we we perform the subgroup analysis for the patient presented with acute limb ischemia or chron or critical limb ischemia. Maybe it's maybe it's chronic. The, the significant association did not change. So in this similar. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments from our panel? If not, uh, we've got our last pre presenter, uh, Dr. Deshmer from uh, the NH, uh, I think just from, from India, <laughs> I'll say, and is a as another uh, talk on the, the arterial puncture. So he's on the another a simple reproducible common femoral artery puncture technique using radiological markers to ensure safe zone puncture. So it will be interesting to see how this uh, compared with a previous speaker from uh, Egypt. So, Dr. Deshmer. Good afternoon from India. I'm here, Dr. Baba Saeed Deshmukh, to present a simple reproducible 
common femoral artery puncture technique using radiologic marker to ensure the safe zone puncture. Femoral arterial vascular access remain one of the most crucial steps to master for beginners in a modern interventional cardiology. Increasing usage of radial access for coronary intervention has reduced the exposure of femoral access to beginners and experts alike. Despite multiple published methods and operator preference, there is, remain unmet need for a simple and quick reproducible technique ensuring safe zone puncture so that when the need arises, interventional fellows are not found wanting. In this study, we describe a technique that is combination of palpatory method assisted by radiologic guidance. In our study, 440 consecutive patients were, who presented for the femoral interventions were randomized in one is to one fashion to control and intervention group. In a control group, patient underwent arterial puncture by conventional Seldinger's technique using maximum pulsatility of the femoral pulse below the inguinal crease as a landmark for the arterial puncture. In interventional group, the following method was carried out to locate the site of puncture. Following aseptic precaution, femoral head was delineated under the fluoroscopic guidance. The radio opaque marker like puncture needle was placed at a junction of upper two third and lower one third of femoral head parallel to imaginary line joining the greater and lesser trochanter. This showed in this figure. A surface puncture point was identified in a region four centimeter below this needle where the femoral artery was best palpable. At the end of each procedure, a femoral angiogram was taken in both groups using the diluted contrast and the site of puncture in relation to the femoral head was noted. As per the definition, the safe zone is area between inferior epigastric artery above and bifurcation of common femoral artery below. Now coming to the results, we categorize complication into the major and minor complication. Of the 440 patients included in this study, 5.6% had some form of major complication in the form of large hematomas, pseudoaneurysm or absent femoral path suggesting overall low prevalence of major complication. Strikingly, a number of such complications was 0.05% in the intervention group compared to the 9% in control group. When, we, when the two groups were analyzed for the complication rate and risk factor, it was found that the rate of overall complication was significantly higher in those patients with diabetes and increased waist hip ratio. However, our technique fared better than the conventional palpatory method. See the sig statistically significant in the uh, increased waist hip ratio and diabetes. Of total 20 major complications reported in the study, 19 occurred in a control group of which in a 15 that means 80% cases puncture was below the safe zone. Most strikingly, pseudoaneurysm were present only in control group. Using this new technique, safe zone puncture was significantly higher in the intervention group compared to the control group with consistently lower rate of complication. Now coming to the, our con study of conclusion. This was prospective randomized control study our technique nullifies the effect of anatomical vari variation on the rate of vascular access site complication as it ensures the presence of bony prominence in the form of head of femur behind the puncture site in the majority of efficient hemostasis. Overall rate of complication was lower in a fluoroscopic guided group compared to the conventional group and it was statistically significant and the same trend was observed in, in the case of major complication. This benefit was conferred due to the, our ability to hit the safe zone more consistently with fluoroscopic method. This technique was particular, 
benefit among the high risk subject like diabetic and increased waist hip ratio where such underlying condition may affect the access and anatomy of the femoral artery and technique was easy to master and execute for an entry level operator and results were highly reproducible disclosure thank you and regards from india uh, thank you for your presentation uh, is there any any comments from our, our panel uh, dr yukoi Thank you very much for the nice presentation, very interesting. Uh, my question to you, the, this puncture in the two femoral artery, the uh, retrograde puncture or antegrade puncture, which uh, puncture including? Only uh, antegrade puncture, same Antegrade, I see, thank you. Yes, Professor An, got a question. Uh, Others we are looking at yeah, close technique in your case, right? Sorry? What kind of device do you use to closing? The, we, we didn't uh, close the... Uh, uh, you, we didn't use any clo closure device. We just uh, compress the femoral artery for the uh, hemostasis. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think your data show you're able to hit the uh, the safe zone ninety percent of the time with your technique. Is it correct? Yes. So how are we going to improve for the last ten percent to hit it every time? I think uh, I think other same comments before. I think using landmark, as you say, can hit the uh, safe zone most of the time. Yeah. But there are variations. People do high palpitations. Sometimes people have very, you know, and all that. Uh, and so I think. If available, I think uh, a lot of us start using ultrasound, uh, handheld ultrasound as a, as, a, as a guide because you can visualize exactly where you, where you hit your femoral, especially it's quite important if you obviously using large bore access, therefore. Um, so I think I understand some hospitals or some countries may not have ready access to ultrasound, but you know, this may be a, a good way to get you to the 100% of the time. Thank you. So any other comments from other panels? Well, if not, uh, I'd like to the close this session. So we'll have five excellent uh, presentations and also some uh, lively discussion on the topic. And uh, so, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the, the just want to close this is the first uh, abstract session for the endovascular. Uh, uh, so that's stream for the TCTAP 2021. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much.